I think the comment there was like, am I younger than Apple? Yes. Well, am I younger than how long you've used Apple? Um, so the answer to that is yes. All right. You know what? I was going to do some live polling as part of my presentation. Um, so instead of doing that, I was going to do that through a phone, but instead of doing that on the phone, I can have just raised hands instead. So I was going to ask, is this your first time at the DevOps conference? You should raise your hand this first time. Wow, like almost everyone, I think. OK, how many people is not the first time they've come? OK, OK, amazing. Yeah, of course, well, I hope you come back <laughs> before. Um, but it's like, that's like 90% new people, so that's very, very cool. Um, second question I was going to ask was, uh, I wanted to hear like, who, a little bit about you. So I, I can talk about myself while we do that, and then I want to ask a little bit about you. So um, my name is Cheryl. You can find me on Twitter at OISHeryl. I currently work for Apple, um, and I also run the Cloud Native London Meetup, which has about 6,000 members. We talk about cloud native technologies, platforms based in London. Um, most people know me from CNCF, uh, and I was also previously an engineer at Google. Um, but more importantly, uh, last year I became a mum for the first time, so I now have a little baby. And it's one of those uh, new parent experiences where you start to rethink like, what is actually important, what do you actually want to spend your time on? And that was why, on reflecting on what I was doing within infrastructure, um, I really thought about like, what matters? What matters in, within infrastructure? And one of the goals that I really wanted to focus on and that I've been exploring is what, what is sustainable infrastructure? Because you can even see out here, there's all these trends about, you know, going green, the buildings that we're in, COP27 is happening in a couple of weeks. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about, like, what is sustainable infrastructure? And what could we do as um, infrastructure builders, technologists, engineers, what are tools and frameworks, how do we think about this? So, that was a little bit, <laughs> this is going to be fun, okay, I might, have to, I might just have to stand up and do this. So, that's my, that was a little bit about me, so like, I want you to raise your hand if you are like uh, an architect, it's something close to architects, okay, uh, like front-end developers, Oh, one or two, yeah, nice. Backend developer. Okay, a few more. Uh, SRE, DevOps, platform engineer. Okay, probably most people, I would guess, half, at least half people, I think. What else? Um, engineering manager, CTO executive type. Cool, handful as well. Uh, anything else? Any other things? Jack of all trades. Jack of all trades, nice. So, yeah, I missed that one. Say again. Product, yeah. Okay. Um, cool. So I wanted to just uh, I wanted to ask that because I wanted to think about how we're going to uh, what are the different tools and the frameworks that we can use to think about sustainable infrastructure. So the problem with infrastructure is that the compute is still growing. The demand is still growing. We have really compute intensive workloads like machine learning. And the demand for compute power goes up faster than the hyperscalers can, um, uh, can optimize for it. Which means over time, the efficiency is going down. And that's not sustainable, right? We want, we want this to go, we want this to level up. It's like Moore's law, uh, you know, your software cannot, it's just eating up all the gains that Moore's law uh, gives you in terms of hardware. So we need to find a way to uh, reduce those compute demands and be thoughtful about it so that over time, we're not getting this exponential curve for compute. Um, I, here's, a, here's a couple of questions, just to get an idea of um, what we're building and how it reflects with the outside world. So. The, what percentage of the world's electricity do you think is used by data centers? I'll give you four options. And just raise your hand when you think it's the right one. So first option, 0.5%. 
1%? Okay, so the last one was correct. So 4% of the entire world's electricity goes on data centers. Okay, second question. So if, I, if you have a phone with you, uh, please go to this link, or cheryl.com slash p, and we'll continue on the live polling question. We were saying, what industry uh, data centers produce as much CO2 as which industry? Okay. So you should see four options here. You've got aviation, agriculture, manufacturing, and shipping. Um, there is also a longer link to this thing, pollev.com, if you missed that one, but oishowell.com slash p for polling. Let's see what people think. Oh, 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 oh this is changing. I'm glad people are working out this polling. Aviation's pulling ahead. Give people a few more seconds to figure out the, the polling and sign in. There's no, we don't need to download anything, it's just a web page. Oh, shipping's coming up. Okay, I think some people might be changing their minds here. So, answer is aviation, very good. Um, agriculture and manufacturing is much higher. Uh, shipping is a bit lower, uh, but data centers use a significant, produce a significant amount of CO2. Okay, and one more question: Data centers produce as much greenhouse gases as which country? Your options here are Canada, Germany, India, or Mexico. Again, people, you should be able to choose one answer from this. Think about the amount of greenhouse gases that you're producing. Germany is in the lead. That's not a home advantage to uh, Europe, I hope. Okay, feels like, feels like we're starting to settle. Um, very good, you got that one correct as well. Okay, yes, it is Germany. India and Mexico, despite having many more people, produce far fewer greenhouse gases. Um, and Canada and Germany are a bit similar, but overall, Germany is a little bit higher. So the Climate Pledge is something that was launched by Amazon a couple of years ago. And the Climate Pledge is this idea that we need to, this, this cannot continue, this trend, right? We have to get together within the industry, within companies and organizations, and try and implement all of the things that were agreed within the Paris climate change. But the idea is Paris 10 years early. We want to make progress towards this so that we can actually get to net zero by 2040, not by 2050. There's over 400 companies that have signed up for this now. Um, many really big ones here, so there's Coca-Cola, Mercedes-Benz, Uber, IBM, Microsoft, and more and more companies are signing up. So this trend is happening, it's coming, and I wanted to give, give you some ideas about how to think about this uh, in advance of, I guess, 2040. Okay, so how should I think about sustainable architecture and sustainable infrastructure? So there's this new term called green ops. Has anybody heard of green ops, by the way? Just a handful of people, yeah. So green ops is this idea that we need to provide some way to measure and understand our environmental impact of using public cloud. And we need to use those measurements in order to optimize it and make the right compromises. And it's always going to be a compromise Obviously, we can't use zero resources at all, so the challenge is always going to be how are we going to minimize our resource consumption so that and while, using, while building the things that we want to. So the overall goal of GreenOps is ensure that the cloud services that you use have the lowest possible environmental impact. And this is not entirely brand new, this way of thinking. In fact, this is stolen from the FinOps, or financial operations. And the, fi the FinOps approach is very much the same thing. It's uh, informed by measuring and getting visibility into things, um, optimize it, make trade-offs, 
and then operate it within a lean culture and put policies and governance around that. And I really like this because this means that we can steal a lot of ideas from FinOps. Um, for instance, in FinOps, you don't try and attack everything at once. You focus on the things that cost you the most and you optimize those first. Um, and if you just replace cost with carbon, it's much the same idea. So I think FinOps has a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas and frameworks that we can actually steal. Secondly, there's this idea of sustainability in the cloud versus sustainability of the cloud. So the idea is that, okay, the hyperscalers are going to be responsible for the, the sustainability of the cloud, things like the data centers, the heating, the waste, the, um, the physical buildings themselves. But we still need to make the right choices when it comes to uh, data architecture, how we store. So for instance, if you're deploying, if you're replicating your data across multiple regions for availability, do you actually need all of those? Or is it something that you could cut back and reduce the number of um, regions that you're deploying to? And this is why it's all a trade-off, it's all a compromise. But I have a, a continuing the poll here. I want to ask, what tools and methods do you use for optimizing workloads at the moment? Do you use horizontal or vertical pod auto-scaling? Do you use event driven scaling? Operators, oh, somebody uses cost, cost, carbon aware scheduling. Batch workload specific scheduling, do you have a custom Kubernetes scheduler? Well, lots of people are using, well, HPA, I would assume that. So I would argue that if you are using any of these already, you're already thinking in the right way. You're already thinking, how am I going to use the resources the most appropriately and the most efficiently? It's obviously you cannot, you know, have, you don't want to pay for peak demand always. So if you're using anything like auto scaling, then this is the same idea. Oh, 18% of people are using serverless. That's actually very interesting to me. Um, I haven't seen so much serverless before. Hi, we are Epicode and we are behind the DevOps conference. DevOps is not a role. It's a way to increase organizations' ability to deliver applications and services faster with better quality. If Agile and DevOps are not yet part of your whole organization, reach out to us and let's discuss how to make them real for you. You can find us at ethico.com. The links are in the description. Have a great time with the DevOps conference talk. OK, so now I want to share some uh, trends and tools that are coming up with Kubernetes specifically. And there's a particular group that has launched just in May, a few months ago, called the Technical Advisory Group for Environmental Sustainability. And this was launched by a group with including people from Red Hat and Intel. And the whole goal of this group is to get like-minded people together and to focus on things like uh, building an ecosystem of environmentally sustainable tools and frameworks, defining some best practices, and educating and providing awareness for end users. So I would check out this group if you want to find out more approaches. It is very new. Um, I believe they're just about to launch a survey around environmental sustainability in different companies. Um, but there's a GitHub page, there's a mailing list, uh, and they also meet on Zoom twice a month. So I would check this out if you want to continue looking forward for this. OK, so some ideas about what you could do to look at environmental sustainability. Um, first one is, how do you measure what you're actually using? There's a couple of different tools here. One is called Cloud Carbon Footprint. So that's measuring the, cloud, the carbon footprint of public cloud usage. The uh, second one is called Kepler, so if you use Prometheus, uh, then you can actually export those carbon metrics straight into your Prometheus dashboards and wherever else you need it, and uh, you look at your carbon usage alongside all of the other metrics. Another one, uh, questions about sustainability on the infrastructure. 
So there's a couple of tools here that will let you downscale automatically. Um, cube green and cube downscaler if you know that your workloads are lower at the weekends or over the evenings, then you can actually set these things up to automatically reduce the resource usage in those times. And sustainability of the infrastructure. Uh, one option you could consider is using newer, more efficient processes. For instance, all of the major cloud providers now have ARM-based processes. And if you can use those, then you can reduce the amount of energy that you're be and power that you're using for your compute. Uh, and you could, if you're using private cloud, you could also consider moving to the hyperscalers because they have the economies to economies of scale and reach to, uh, to, to focus on this kind of efficiency. So a little summary for you. Um, first of all, the climate pledge is coming. This is the group that is trying to get the Paris Agreement 10 years early, 20, 2040, get to net zero in 2040, not 2050. The bigger companies are already signed into this, and this is trickling down. So even if you're not looking at any kind of environmental, environmental sustainability factors now, it's going to come up. So you should get ahead of the curve. Secondly, use the FinOps approach. So measure what you're doing, optimize it, find the places that are the hotspots that you can optimize and make the biggest impact with the smallest amount of effort, and then continue to operate those continuous improvement. We've heard about that in a few different talks as well today. Thirdly, join that environmental sustainability group if this is something you're interested in, and take their survey. It will be out shortly, um, and that will really allow us as an industry to figure out whether we're going on the right path here. And lastly, just a thought from me. So I really truly do believe that what we're building matters. It really matters. And that we as individuals have that empathy and knowledge and ambition to build better. I really believe that all of you have that capacity. And I really believe that we as a community can make a big difference. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Um, these slides are on my blog as well. I think that was a very heroic effort. I was going to ask for another round of applause for you for getting through that. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Dead. Thank you to the AV people for quickly rigging this up because this was quite <laughs> Excellent amazing. Excellent solution. Yeah. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes, please. Has Apple tried doing a calculation on the carbon footprint that the Mac CPU, the new one ARM, has lowered the footprint based on Intel? Um, based on Intel, based on ARM, you mean the change of the processor? Uh, yes. I mean, I don't have specific numbers for you because it's a different group, but one of the obvious learnings that they took from all the devices, from the phones and so on, is that you can, it's, it's lower power, it's better price performance using ARM processors. So yes, I can definitely say they have, that's taken into account for sure. Great but question. I don't have numbers. Also, Apple is very secretive about anything they do. So even if I did have the numbers, I'm not sure I could share it. Excellent. One more? Anyone? Hi. Thank you for your speech. Uh, there's an argument that as long as development hours, right, and cost of a developer fixing something is more expensive than computing power will never improve this. Can you say something positive uh, that will help us fight that opinion? <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK. Perhaps this is not positive in the way that you think that, that you mean, but one of the other reasons that I mentioned in this is the, the FinOps approach is that it, it means that doing the right thing and saving the business money lines up really nicely. 
So you can sell this idea to the greater business as, yeah, this is good for environmental sustainability and it's a good moral thing to do, but it's good for the business. It means that we're using resources more efficiently. And to be honest, I think as engineers, we should be being careful of what we're using, right? There's no, um, yes, we can continue to build bigger and bigger. And I think the cloud providers actually make that too easy sometimes. It's just invisible what you're doing, right? It's just one command and something happens and you don't see the impact of it. But I think we have the skills and the empathy to be able to do better than that and to be aware of that. So perhaps it's not, a, it's not positive in the sense of, I, I'm not a big believer in, you know, oh, just do the right thing because it's the right thing, because that's hard to argue. But if we do the right thing, it's better for the company. We should be doing those things as engineers as well. All right, thank you. We're still early. We could maybe take one more if somebody really has something that they think everybody would love to hear the answer to. I think we have one over here. Yes, please. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, so curious to talk about, you know, the sustainability of the architecture. And you had one point about code efficiency, and it made me think a bit about from a development perspective, often when we're going into architecting new solutions, we don't think as much about sustainability. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of before we have anything running that we can do metrics on or downscale. Mm -hmm. Have you any thoughts about the process of like, you know, thinking sustainability already into the planning phase of considering architecture? Yeah. Um, so first of all, that you can find ranked lists of like, this language is more efficient than this one. Um, I'm a bit hesitant to believe those. I think it very much depends on what you're, you're building and the productivity of your developer is more important than you know, whether you're picking necessarily one language over another. Also, compilers are amazingly efficient now. So it's better to pick something that, you know, if you have a, if you have a bunch of redundant stuff, the compiler is going to get rid of it anyway. Um, but certainly, like, in, terms of your, in terms of your code, you can easily find uh, certain languages are more energy efficient than others. Um, you could think about SLAs. For instance, uh, at, well, as I mentioned before, if you are replicating data across regions in order to get high, avail high availability of that data, um, how much downtime could you actually tolerate? How many regions do you need to actually, du to actually duplicate in? Because each one of those is a huge cost, right? Um, let me see. I think there were some others. I know you can't see the slides at the moment, but um, there was something else I wanted to mention as well. Uh, okay, I can't remember what it is. But I think those are the two areas that I would really focus on, and then focus on the utilization and scaling well would be the next stage. Cool. All Thank right. you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.